Hey, y'all, please take a seat. So excited to be with y'all. My name is John. I serve as pastor here at the Springs. If it's your first time with us, welcome. We sincerely mean it when we say we would love to get to know you. If you've been coming for a long time, welcome back. I want to start this morning by reading a section of scripture. The first section we're going to briefly touch on, but it's not where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. In the second section, that's where we're really going to focus. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me at home. You can grab your phone, pull it up, whatever you'd like, or you're welcome to find it on the screen. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read a section, verses 31 through 37. The first section is a theme of marriage, divorce, remarriage. The second section is the theme of oaths, promises, pledges, commitments. We'll quickly break down marriage, divorce, remarriage. Jesus, he's actually going to give an entire half of a chapter in Matthew 19 to that topic. So we're going to touch on that one, but where we're going to focus the majority of our time today is going to be on oaths. So read with me Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 37. It was also said, Jesus speaking to the crowd there, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, as well as primarily his disciples, those listening and overhearing, he's giving them a better interpretation of the law. He's showing you, me, and them. Hey, you may think you have it all together, but you don't. He says, it was also said, verse 31, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, this is the new theme, you shall not swear falsely, keep your promises, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. We read through two sections, marriage, divorce, oaths. What's the connecting dot between the two? Jesus uses them both to expose in you and me, and we'll work through this, how they had, how we have a desperate need for inner righteousness. Well, let's talk about divorce. This is one of those sticky subjects. Your Bible's full of it. One of the things Jesus never does is he never shies away from topics. He's always looking to come and where people and where culture, they feel darkness, they feel guilt, they feel shame, they feel set apart, they feel less than, they feel, and some of you, you feel this way this morning. When we talk about divorce, you feel like in your life, it's perhaps the scarlet letter. It's the thing that you don't want people to know. It's the thing that you run from. Jesus comes with grace to all. Sin is a real thing. One of the things that your Bible will do is it will give a sincere, honest, truth in love breakdown of how do you define marriage? How should we consider divorce? What does Jesus teach here? And then even from the divorce, what are the implications thereof of remarriage? A few key things that you need to know. Part of the reason Jesus is talking about this is it is a covenant promise. But we're going to spend most of our time unpacking marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It's in Matthew 19. The reason we're going to wait is because that's where I would have read this, taught a brief part, jumped to Matthew 19. But some of the building context that comes as he's in the upper rooms with his disciples, it's going to be helpful. But here's the reason I do want to briefly touch on it. Divorce, statistically, has impacted, either through parents or own lives, the vast majority of everyone in this room. Some of you right now, you sit here and you think, hey, I'm considering marriage, but honestly, I've seen the brokenness and the fallenness of divorce from my parents or or the fallout from culture. Why even do it? Some of you are here and you're you're married and you're wanting to enrich and strengthen your marriage. Why? Because you never want the D word to be on the table. Some of you, you're here 
and you have been fighting for a healthy marriage for a long time, and you're exhausted. And maybe you even once said, I would never get divorced, but now you, self, you find yourself thinking about it. Some of you, you filed papers. Some of you, you are divorced. You've moved on. You've remarried. Here's what you need to know. God's word gives clear care to everyone, regardless of their situation or circumstance with this. I don't want you to have to wait until Matthew 19. If you have questions, concerns, doubts, prayers of repentance and hope, wondering in wisdom, what should I do? Asking in submission before God, God, how would you have me respond? We will care for you. We will turn pages and we will point you to God's word. But that's the brief part about marriage, divorce, remarriage. One of the things I've loved, y'all don't know this, but as a communicator, preacher, I've known this. We started 2021 just coming out swinging, right? We're right there in Sermon on the Mount. If you haven't been with us, here's what we, we've covered. First weekend, we redemptively looked at 2020 and reached back to see all the ways that God had used 2020 to hopefully, Lord willing, make us more like him. Week after that, we addressed capital riots. Week after that, we realized we're all murderers. Last week, we're all adulterers. Jesus, he switches, and he's like, hey, now we're going to talk about divorce, which in this culture, it was more rampant than even in our culture. And now we're going to talk about oaths. Now we're going to talk about pledges, commitments. So transitioning into that, I want to start by asking you guys a question. Anybody here ever make one of those like blood oaths with a friend growing up? You know, you did it. You've seen movies about it, right? Anybody ever have one of those things where you get a cut and your best friend gets a cut and you come together and you're like, blood brothers, I, this might be misogynistic. I don't, I don't think a lot of females did this, right? They probably like got a BFF bracelet or something like that where you like shake hands, like we're brothers forever. Or you could come and I can remember, maybe it was elementary school or middle school, something like that. The BFF bracelets where like one friend, and this was in general with gals, one friend got one half of the heart, the other friend got the other half, and when they came together, it fit perfectly. No? Y'all didn't have friends? All right. I get it. Middle school, it's a tough time. There's grace for that. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you made a pinky promise? When was the last time you went to somebody? Honestly, mine was this, this morning in kind of a comedic sense. When was the last time you looked at somebody and you made a promise? Oh, when was the last time that you said, I swear to God, right? Now, if you're a Christian, you know, you're like, wait, can I do that? Should I not do that, right? You're sitting there. Or you said you were telling the truth. Or do you remember playing a game growing up where you said something was true, but then you like crossed your fingers? And because you crossed your fingers, it was like the truth technical loophole that you could get your way out of a commitment, Right? I'm sure none of y'all have ever done that. Bunch of liars. Here's the reason I start with that. Those are simple. Silly. Throw away elementary, childish examples of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about them in a way that's a little deeper, a little more serious, but Jesus is going to address oaths, pledges, and commitments before God, and he's going to address it in that culture, in this one, because he's trying to uphold a value. He's trying to say to you, to me, to them, you're only as good as your word. You're only as good as your word. And he's going to take oath, these commitments before God that we'll talk about, and he's going to use it with them, and he's going to use it with me, and he's going to show us their word was no good. And they reflected God as they did it. So though they had the appearance, though they could put on this religious show, their version of Sunday best, internally, they had a problem. He's going to talk about how followers of him they're meant to be people. It's the simple words, integrity, to be truthful. Why? Not only does it reflect him, but also just brings a better life. 
Anybody here ever have like serious damage to relationships because people have used language like, I know you're telling me that, but I don't trust you're going to do it. Why? Because you may have said it before, said it before, said it before. He's, he's doing that because he wants people of him to not have to swear, to not have to plead, to not have to invoke God to build a sense of credibility with someone else. That their integrity would just be that. Why? You and I are only as good as our word. We're going to be in Matthew 5. We're looking at verses 33 through 37 to see how you and I were only as good as our word. And here's why this really matters. If you're here and you don't believe in Jesus, here's what you have total um, freedom to do. You can do whatever you want, I imagine. Like the white lie, go for it. Or the simple lie that you really use, but you justify, well, it's because it's going to help me here. I can get an advantage in this business deal, in this relationship. Followers of Jesus Christ, your word is your bond because your word is meant to represent truth. And you represent the one who is truth. So we'll be in Matthew 5, 33 through 37 as we are continuing our way through Jesus' sermon on the mount. I'm going to read the verses again, and then we're going to work our way through it. Matthew 5, 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. Jesus is setting up a reference to Old Testament scripture here. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, Jesus is giving the greater interpretation. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you not, cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Your, your Bible, it may translate from evil, it may have it in there, and scholars talk about which one it should be. Anything more than this comes from evil, or anything more than this comes from the evil one. Today we're going to talk about how you and I, we are only as good as our word, and followers of Jesus hear me when I say, your word is meant to be good. We're seeing here in Jesus' teaching on oaths. That in this culture, and we're going to break it down because I get oath then versus oath now. It's a little bit of a chasm. There's a little bit of a difference. So we're going to cross that chasm. But he's saying there's a hypocritical use of oaths, and it exposes in them, and it's going to expose in you and me the absence of truth, which is the absence of integrity. What I want to do first, though, is answer what is an oath? What was its original intention for a first century Jew? Right here, Jesus, when he says, you've heard that it was said. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. He's actually combining three different passages into the Old Testament principle of what an oath was meant to be. An oath was when someone made a claim, a promise, or a commitment. And to give it credibility, to bring a sense of authority to it, they would invoke God. They would bring God into it which in essence made God three things for this pledge, this promise. It made God witness. It made God guarantor. And it made God the judge if they didn't follow through on it. It was serious. You see, we may not take oaths the same way they did then. Back then, it was necessary for culture. It was very different, like contractual agreements. How do you come and make pledges? The whole thing was different. But we still use oaths today. For example, some of you, you might be a physician. You took the Hippocratic Oath, right? You, you may have come and you may be married and you stood before one another and you pledged vows. You made an oath. We can see this when folks go into our military and they enlist public servants who swear an oath. You can do it when you become an attorney. 
you do this when you come, and in the mornings, perhaps, if you're a student, you say that I pledge to allegiance. Most recently, we saw this at a national scale when President Joe Biden swore an oath. I I don't know if you guys knew this, right? But that is the exact same oath that was given by George Washington, except there were four words that changed. Four words have changed. Those words changed in 1881. It's fascinating. You know what four words they added to it? It's at the very end. So help me God. Why? Oaths invoke God. It's meant to be a sense of severity and seriousness. You see, an oath was used, especially in Jewish culture then, right? An oath was used to say, in the midst of a fallen culture, a culture of lies and deception and people taking advantage of one another, an oath was meant to be this stamp, this certificate that held something out as truth. It was this promise and this seal of, this is not fake news. This is real. You can trust it. God has said it. I will do it. And if I don't, God is the avenger. It's meant to be serious. It's meant to be an aspect of faith. And it was meant to represent truth against a culture of falsehood. Do you see that? But what they were doing is they weren't using oaths in that way. See, they did what you and I can do. They were starting to find the loopholes. They were starting to find the technicalities. They were starting to drift from that. And they were eroding what God had intended. That's why Jesus is talking about oaths here. He's bringing them up because this was a huge thing in their culture, huge thing. And they were taking advantage and they were abusing them in two key ways. The first was in significance. You see, you were meant to take an oath for not everything, but matters of major significance. That's an aspect in our culture that at times still carries over, right? But at this time, what they were doing is they were taking oaths flippantly. They were using them for almost everything. And here's the thing. It's literally removing the purpose of an oath. If an oath is meant to bring seriousness, severity, and significance, if you do it all the time, it doesn't make it special. I can remember July 12th, right? 2014. I stood before Taylor Lee Fuller, and by the grace of God, she pledged to become Taylor Lee Almquist, to have and to hold from this day forward, in goodness and in badness. I don't remember what the language was there, right? In sickness and in health and wealth and if I'm broke, whatever. The highs and the lows pledged all of that. I haven't really made a vow like that with someone else. I, I haven't. But imagine if in that moment it carried significance. Imagine though if culturally we just went around and we made oaths with everybody. It would literally be ridiculous. It would be nonsensical. It would defeat the purpose of the significance in an oath. Like I thought about it. What if I, one of the things Christians are called to be is great neighbors, right? You are called to be a great neighbor. I have two neighbors, Gabe, Kelby, Drew, April. I'm going to talk about Drew. I'm doing some landscaping work, so I've been working with Drew. What if I went before him, and the same way I pledged an oath to my wife, I started and Christians went around. I, John Omquist, take thee, Drew, that's the guy that lives next door, to be my legally platted adjacent landowner. To have, but not to hold, from this day forward, for better, for worse, with green grass, or, and this is usually, if you know my yard, right? With green grass or a weed-riddled, unkempt yard, with a barking dog or screaming kids, I pledge to be your neighbor. I pledge this oath till the day one of us moves away according to God's holy ordinance, so help me God. What if we went around and we made oaths with people for simple, flippant things? We invoke the things of God. You erode the significance. That's one thing they were doing and abusing what God intended to be solemn. The second thing they were doing was not just in significance, but they were abusing it in its, its essence. Do you remember an oath was meant to be an ex, uh, exclamation point of truth? out and away beyond falsehood. But Jews, the covenant people of God, religious leaders, Pharisees, 
They were neglecting the essence that it was meant to represent truth. See, they were using oaths to manipulate, to deceive, and to persuade people, oftentimes in a business sense so they could gain an advantage. For example, let me give you some of the things that they were doing. Pharisees at this point, they had built a hierarchy of oaths. These were legal loopholes, and they were invoking before God. For example, if you swear an oath to God, that oath was binding. But if you swear an oath to God's stuff, his creation, his things, that oath was not binding. Either by heaven, for it is the throne room of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Those are his They would go on, if you swear toward Jerusalem, that oath in this culture, it was binding. But if you swear to Jerusalem, it was not binding. Or to Jerusalem, the city of the great king. You you would see this in Matthew 26. If you swear to the gold inside the temple, right? The temple, that was a place where the presence of God, they would go. If you swear to the gold, that oath was binding. But if you swear to the temple itself, not binding. If you swear to a gift on the altar, binding. If you swear to the altar, not binding. Religious leaders were using these as legal loopholes to come and make pledges, persuade people to get themselves in positions of advantage. And then when it came to payment or collection, they would come and they would slip out the much way silly kids cross their fingers and say, I didn't have to keep the truth. They would make these oaths invoking the things of God or God. And they used it to deceive when God had intended it to represent truth. See, we don't go around making oaths all the time in the same way. But here's what was true then and here's what can be true now. God has always been a representative of truth. His people were meant then to represent truth. We, as his church, we are meant to represent truth now. Jesus is saying to them, you're only as good as your word, and your word is no good. Therefore, that's much of the context of what he's doing here in the Sermon on the Mount. He's showing them you have a desperate need for help. You think your external righteousness is good enough that you can check these boxes as you look around and this comparison game of quote-unquote righteousness. Your comparison game is foolishness. You are desperately wicked and in need of a savior. He's using something then that they did all the time that brought in God and they used it to deceive, to disadvantage, and to corrupt. As an example, you are desperately sick. Now, for us today, yes, you can come and take major oaths and you can violate them. You can break them. And that is wrong. But at times, it is different from that culture to this one. I don't operate having to go around and create a sense of credibility or authority to take an oath. Now, can I sign a contract where I make a pledge? Can I come and, for example, even pull out debt on a house and then make a commitment to debt or to taxes and to pay it and yet neglect forsake, try to weasel my way out. Yes, I can do those things and hear me say they are wrong. Why? I am meant to represent the goodness of Jesus Christ. I'm imperfect. I don't have it all together. Neither do you. But as his representative of truth, as his representative of righteousness, you should be able to trust my word. I should not have to come and manipulate or persuade. Jesus is showing them, you need help. You're far more prone to deceive and to lie than what you know. And you are called to represent truth. That's why I think for some of us today, here's why this matters, right? Jesus goes on and he says, and this is where he's going to get really practical. He's going to come and he's going to say, therefore, well, he doesn't actually say therefore, it's an implication of it. Let what you say be simply yes or no. What is meant to mark his people? Simple truth. 
Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. What are oftentimes the reason that folks come and they try to manipulate, persuade, say, no, no, I swear you need to trust me. Those are the folks we tend to not not really trust. Like the one who comes and says to you and has to always say it, hey, if I'm being honest, if I'm being honest, if I'm being honest, or they come and say, no, no, I swear this one's true. I swear this one's true. I swear this one's true. We don't trust those people. Jesus is saying the integrity of your life is meant to show up, and when you say yes, it's a yes. When you say no, it's a no. But you and I, we have a tendency, even though Jesus calls us to say yes. Yes. We, Christians, as well as non-Christians, we have a tendency to say yes, parentheses, unless. Right? We're supposed to just say yes, but what you and I have a tendency to do is to say yes, parentheses, unless. Unless something better comes along. Unless my commitment gets too challenging or too hard. Yes, and we don't say unless, right? We don't do that, but we have friends that we get invited over to their house for dinner. We say yes, but we don't say to them, hey, that's unless I can find some people I enjoy more that are doing perhaps an activity or outing I enjoy more, and then I may not show or I might cancel at the last minute, but not give you an honest reason for it. Like, we don't come and put, and honestly, this is one of the things in, in marriage, um, premarital counseling, you always come through, and I work with couples on the vows. And I say, okay, guys, what can dissolve this union? What could break it up? Put it in the vow. But you can't say, till death do us part. But it's not in the vow. Stay more for Matthew 19, marriage, divorce, remarriage. We don't come and add the unless but we tend to mean that. I can tend to mean that. What are the two reasons we internally feel this? It it is one, we say yes, and and that's unless something better comes along. How how many of us, like the average millennial, I think right now, and then gen whatever after is making it even worse, they keep a job for two years. Companies are starting to now have inclusions. Hey, with this, you got to stay for two years. Why? Because one of the things folks will do is they'll come and they'll commit and they'll say, yes, I'll stay for this many years. And then they start to look around and, hey, the grass looks a little greener over there. I can get a jump in title. I can get a jump in pay. And they use this to leapfrog to that. Hear me say, there's great reasons to leave jobs, but do you see there's an integrity issue there? There's a truth issue. It is a yes, unless I find something better. The boyfriend, the guy who goes to just meet a gal, gets to know her for the first time, and he says, I'll call you. Anybody ever not had the guy call back? You don't have to raise your hand on that one. Fellas, don't say that. Just be quiet, or if you say it, you call. Simple illustrations of how we are meant to represent truth and integrity with what we say. We also switch it if it just gets too hard. That could be true of the job. That could be true of, for example, some of you, you come and you make a commitment to a local church, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, biblically, you are called to make a commitment to a local body. You don't have to go all in here, but we pray you go all in somewhere. But you come and you'll make a commitment. And that commitment is a, hey, I pledge, I will help this body of believers follow Jesus Christ. And I give them permission to help me follow Jesus Christ. But what happens when that other couple in your community group starts to lean in and say, hey, would you mind if we just spend a little time talking about what's going on in your marriage? Things seem to be a little rocky, and we would love to come and just talk about it. No condemnation, just grace. What do we do? Who are you to talk to me? I know I said I would let you. I know we started all kumbaya, and we even laughed about how eventually we'll get to a point where conflict will arise, and we'll all want to leave, but we'll work through it. But no. I don't want to talk about it. A single community group where folks know about things in your life and they want to lean and talk about it. And you said, hey guys, I give y'all permission to ask me. And then they ask. And it's hard. We bristle. Why? Because even though we've said yes, the commitment 
begins to push against. I, I share that there are some followers of Jesus who, because of this text, they don't take oaths at all in courtrooms or in life. For example, Quakers, I do not think that's what this is teaching. Jesus, he will take an oath before Caiaphas. He will swear to being the son of God. The apostle Paul will take an oath as he is church planting, or he will say, with God as my witness, he is invoking a solemn sense of oath. God in the Old Testament used oaths as proclamations of truth. I was listening to an interview uh, yesterday on a podcast. It was with Hugh Jackman. Everybody's got to love Hugh Jackman, right? Okay, Wolverine greatest showman, any dude that can go from like dancing and singing to just straight like Jack take you down, you're lying if you don't respect it, okay? Right? But I was listening to him and he was talking about his relationship with his dad. His dad became a born again follower of Jesus Christ through a Billy Graham crusade, changed his dad's life. Growing up, he said his dad instilled in him ethics where his dad said to him once, he said, hey, you." If you commit to going to dinner with your neighbor on a Tuesday, after you make that commitment, the queen invites you to dinner with her that same Tuesday. You do not have dinner with the queen. Here's what I'm telling you, right? I think you call your neighbor and you say, hey, neighbor, right? You call your friend and you say, hey, friend. I committed to having dinner with you. I need to ask for my commitment back. I'm sorry. Hey, will you forgive me? I'm changing it. Here's why. I've been invited to dinner with the queen. That's not a common experience in my life. I would like the opportunity to go to dinner with the queen. And if your friend and or neighbor says, no, how dare you? And they put in some technical thing. That's not loving. Rebuke them and then go to dinner with the queen. I share that. Is I don't think we need to become legalistic in the reverse side of this. But what is meant to be true here? What's Jesus teaching? You're only as good as your word. Let me ask you, in business deals, how's your word? What if after you make a commitment in a boardroom, you come out and a week later, lawyers identify or they find, hey, here's something you could exploit. Here's something you could do. Let's go back and renegotiate. I'm not saying that's always wrong, but I'm saying, who are you? Let's say, husbands, we, we say, hey, sweetheart, I'll take care of X, Y, and Z around the house or with the kids this week. Do we follow through? What does that look like? Hey, young adult, hey, student, your word is your bond. There's credibility in it because it shows integrity. How is yours? When you say yes, is it yes? Because here's, here's the truth. A promise in marriage, a commitment to being roommates with some of your friends, a pledge to be a part of a local body pursuing a perfect savior on a perfect mission with a bunch of imperfect people. It'll eventually get hard. It'll eventually have cost. Let your yes be yes. We've looked at Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37 to see let your yes be yes. It's this idea of say yes kill within you and within me. Yes, and you'll get what I'm saying, parentheses, unless, dot, dot, dot. Why? You and I, we are meant to represent truth. People of integrity, it matters what we say. So what are some ways practically that you and I, we, we can apply oaths back then, which is different, but similar, but, but different. We can apply this today. One, if you're going around saying, I swear to God, often, frequently, flippantly, stop it. Stop. Do I believe there's moments where you can, before God, make a solemn oath? Yes. Enter it with a sense of reverence and severity. You might add what they added in 1881 to the end of it. So help me God. Some wedding covenant vows they'll put at the end of it. It's actually pulling language from the book of Ruth, but they'll add in the exclamation and understanding of a covenant, they'll add, and may God deal with me, be it ever so severely. 
if anything but death should separate us. I share that as in you can take these oaths, but when you do so, solemn, reverence, and an understanding of it. A second way that you and I can think through this is two. Jesus is saying, be honest, really, here. It's very practical. Tell the truth. Just tell the truth. That sounds obvious, and of course, but tell the truth even when it hurts, when it's costly to do so. When your boss says, hey, did you finish that report for me? And right there, you start to lie and create the excuse about, well, yes, I did, but here's the thing. It was there, and I should have it. It'll be, it'll be here by, just say, I haven't finished it yet. I'm sorry. About 80% through, here's why. Here's when you'll have it. Don't ever make people have to fish for clarity. Don't be the person who someone has to ask you the perfect question for you to be honest. And then you hide behind, well, you didn't ask me. What? Third way, oh, this, this will help a ton of us, including me. Don't overcommit. Right? Get better at saying no. Because then you don't have to go back and say, you know what, I did say yes. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? The dark side of that, though, is living in the sense of, well, I, I want to keep all my options open, and I don't want to fall into the wrong trap, and I don't want to do the wrong thing, so I'm just not going to commit to anything until the last minute. People can't plan their weddings, fill out the RSVP card on time, like show up and see your friends. Don't be that person either. Recognize sometimes it'll come with cost, but let your yes be yes. A final way is when you don't follow through, when your yes becomes a no, say, will you forgive me? They don't need to believe in Jesus for you to ask their forgiveness. I committed to this, but I did this or I'm going to do this. There's a gap between those two. That gap is understandably confusing. I want to be a person of integrity. Will you forgive me? I then keep going. Because here's the thing. Jesus is telling them, you're only as good as your word. He's telling us, you're only as good as our word. But remember, what's a primary driving force here is he's saying their word is not very good. You and I can still have a tendency to be broken, to lie, to manage, to manipulate, to disadvantage by persuasion. That must change. But here again is why this matters so much. Who was as good as his word? This is one of those questions in church where you can just answer with Jesus and it's actually right. Who was absolutely as good as his word? Jesus, who, for those who believe in him, for those who trust him, who does Jesus look at and say yes to, and he never says yes, parentheses, unless. You know who will never do that with you if you believe in him, if you trust for the forgiveness of your sins in the reality of the cross and the resurrection, who will never love you with a yes, unless Jesus Christ. He is the perfect fulfillment and the embodiment of truth. We represent him. We do it imperfectly. He does it perfectly. He loves you. Yes. He's forgiven you. Yes. If you, if you believe in him, you are his daughter. You are his son. Yes. There is no unless clause. There is no back door where you can get fired from being a part of the covenant, faith, family of God. When he says, I will never leave you, there is no unless. Unless you have the abortion, unless you have the affair, unless you neglect the discipleship and the care of your home, unless you are stingy with your finances. Now, if those things mark your life, you have to question if you know the man of truth. But if you know him and you are stumbling towards glory with the rest of us, growing in a perseverance and a faithfulness, his promise to you is yes. He loves you. We represent that promise. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the time this morning. I thank you for just the reality of coming and talking about oaths and even the, finding the ways of saying, hey, what does an oath look like? today. 
Fathers, we recognize one of the primary ways that takes place in our culture is in marriages, or we pray for marriages. We pray for the marriages of this body. May we be people who take the institution, the gift, the display of marriage representing your unconditional love. May we take it really serious. Father, for the folks who hear in the midst of marriage, there's heartache, there's pain, there's confusion. Would you bring grace? Would you grant them a sense of comfort in you and then courage to come and talk with your people who will use your word to bring your care? But Father, would you make us people who are truthful? We thank you that we aren't actually only as good as our word. We are you. We are in you. But Father, from that, may we represent your righteousness. May we represent your truth and what it means to be followers of you. We thank you so much for the privilege of this. We thank you so much that your love for us, it's not a pinky promise, but it was an absolute blood oath. Cost you your life. You died on the cross. And that's an oath that you won't break. We're asking that you'd come and you'd lead us in this time as we respond to your grace in song and worship through communion. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. What I invite you guys to do now here in person as well as at home is just prepare to worship through the act of communion. We'll sing a song. You're welcome to join and stand as we sing or to sit and reflect. But this is a time where followers of Jesus Christ, we recognize the fact that every promise for his believers, he made with a blood oath. And it's an oath he won't break because he loves you and he loves me.